Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, as uh, Laura said, I'll talk about the painting as a body in the Tibetan uh, Buddhist context, which is of course the area of my studies uh, and along with kind of Indian Buddhist art. And so what we see on the map here is a map of the Himalayas with its kind of main sites uh, and the cultural connections in the, the west towards Kashmir, in the south towards uh, Kathmandu and Nepal, and uh, the Indian Plains and in the northeast uh, towards uh, the, uh, the central plains of China and in the north uh, towards uh, Central Asia. And I came to this particular topic of the talk by uh, seeing this uh, painting in the Rubin Museum of Art, uh, uh, in a museum I worked at until I kind of joined SOAS in 2014. And it's uh, quite a fascinating portrait of uh, Nyingma school hierarch that we can't really uh, identify, so a religious kind of uh, specialist, so to speak, with his attributes and uh, his uh, ritual tools on the desk. Uh, but uh, what was surprising is when we look at uh, the details and actually turn the painting around, that he on the back uh, of the painting, he is actually represented from the back. Yeah. And this, of course, triggered the question in how many paintings or what do paintings have at the back? And what does that mean in terms of the interpretation of the painting as a whole? And of course, this uh, immediately kind of tells you why I call it the painting as a body, uh, because you essentially have here the painting representing the, the body of the teacher in its entirety. Uh, on the front side from the front and on the back uh, from the back. And so this would be uh, the overview of that. And so I was starting essentially surveying different paintings and eventually that ended up in a, uh, an exhibition that was called the flip side, focusing on the backs of paintings. And it's actually quite common that uh, the back are decorated and that they have a meaning that complements what is represented on the front. And we can see this uh, on the basis of this uh, mid 19th century Bhutanese painting of a goddess called Vajrayogini uh, that when turned around is particularly revealing because in, in this particular case, the cotton canvas that was used for the painting is transparent and we can actually see quite a lot of the relationship of what we find on the back in relation to the figures in the front. And so what we have here on the back is that for each figure we have three syllables uh, that are essentially symbolizing the purification of the materials the, the painting is made in and it's located at the forehead, neck and heart of each of the figures. And then you have uh, what would be the speech form or the, the mantra, what would be the speech form of uh, the figure represented at, at the front. And in the center of the painting, we have a stupa, uh, a kind of funerary monument originally that became the symbol of Buddhism in general, uh, especially in South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Tibet in East Asia, it became uh, kind of the pagoda, became the preferred uh, monument in this respect. Uh, but in Tibetan Buddhism, the stupa represents the mind. And so this would be the mind form of the deity. And we'll see that the stupa form aligns with the deity in the front of the painting. And so if you look where, where there is the, this kind of uh, squarish section above the dome, uh, that's where the head of the deity is. And the base is exactly where the lotus base is and where 
the, uh, the deity stands. So this would be a common way of representing uh, deities on the painting in Tibetan Buddhism, where the front uh, body form of the deity is complemented by the back form, uh, back uh, representing the speech and the mind form of the deity. So more subtle forms of the deity itself. The same concept was then employed uh, for teacher representations uh, in and especially kind of in the 12th, early 13th century and th throughout the 13th century, there are very, very interesting paintings that uh, kind of make a statement that compares the teacher, the Tibetan Buddhist teacher of the time with the Buddha. And one of the most explicit paintings in that respect is uh, this one. And if we compare its composition with a composition that uh, depicts uh, Buddha Shakyamuni at his awakening with scenes of, of his life represented around him, we'll see that the composition of this teacher representation uh, derives uh, from the Shakyamuni painting and there is a direct comparison uh, between the two. In addition, he is placed in the succession of the seven Buddhas of the past uh, depicted standing on the very top of the canvas and uh, the future Buddha and before the future Buddha Maitreya who is in the uh, top right corner of the canvas of this uh, representation. Uh, again, that would be something that is taken off, off, over from uh, representations of the Buddha. The architecture around the teacher represents the temple of Bodhgaya, where the Buddha uh, attained awakening. And interestingly, on Tibetan paintings, then you find the practitioner uh, represented and here in the in just opposite uh, the bottom left corner of the uh, practitioner in the bottom left corner we have uh, Buddha Shakyamuni represented which essentially means that he has changed place with the Tibetan teacher who is represented in the center of this painting and it's a clear reference to one particular form of Shakyamuni that apparently was uh, present in the temple of Bodhgaya, the site of awakening and the holiest place of Tibetan uh, or of Buddhism in general, uh, that had a peculiar feature, namely a relatively disproportionately large head and a very short neck. And these features are found copied in objects from essentially the, the 13th to the 15th century uh, as kind of reference uh, to the, the Buddha of Bodhgaya. And of course the Buddha on our painting as well has that uh, particular element uh, ascribed to it. But this comparison of the teacher with the Buddha goes further. Yeah, And uh, in this particular example, we have again a teacher portrait but, uh, and we look at this particular example more carefully and in greater detail. It's a very prominent Tibetan Buddhist teacher of the 12th century called Pagmudupa Dorje Gyalpo, who is represented and of whom eight different schools of Tibetan Buddhism branch off essentially. And so if we'll uh, look at the painting, uh, kind of more closely. There are different elements I want to discuss uh, about it. The first one is uh, the notion of a portrait that is uh, kind of communicated in this case. So generally uh, portraits in uh, Tibetan painting are rarely portraits of likeness, yeah? Uh, and it's very clear that in this particular representation, the eyes, for example, are highly idealized and, and compared to those painted for deities, but that they, the, the artist clearly tried to distinguish the area around the mouth 
the nose has a peculiar shape and we have the beard. And this enables us to kind of identify portraits of the same teacher within the same Tibetan Buddhist school and from approximately the same time as uh, seen on the uh, right side example that is still comparable, but obviously painted by a different uh, painter. We can even use these physical features to compare it to a sculpture that depicts the same uh, teacher. And in this particular teacher representation, he is shown frontally as a Buddha. Uh, and I think that comes to the fore here. So in the sculpture, we have this uh, comparison to Buddha Shakyamuni at the site of awakening strongly communicated because the teacher himself is represented frontally. He touches the earth like the Buddha touched the earth when he attained awakening. And uh, even the, the representations on the throne allude to this particular narrative event. But it's very clear that he is a Tibetan teacher because he wears a vest underneath, a sleeveless vest underneath the monastic robes and the, even a heavy cape that uh, protects him from the cold of the Tibetan plateau in comparison to the uh, relative heat of the Indian plains, uh, where these kind of dress features wouldn't be necessary. What the painting differs here, of course, is that it doesn't show the teacher frontally, but it shows him in a succession of uh, the Buddha rather than as the Buddha himself. And that is also represented uh, through the, the teacher on top. So here you have the comparison uh, with the Buddha image. And if we uh, look at the teacher, he has a teaching gesture and if we look further up, uh, immediately on, uh, at the top of him is another gray-haired uh, Tibetan monk represented who is uh, or can be identified as Gambopa, the immediate uh, teacher of Bhagmutupa. And so what uh, the painting emphasizes is less the, the achievement of a single individual as it would be with uh, Buddha Shakyamuni, but uh, the achievement of an, an individual in the tradition of uh, Shakyamuni, that is of course expressed through the teacher represented directly above him, but then also through the Buddha representations left and right uh, of uh, essentially the arch or the rock arch uh, at the top of the central panel that uh, also allude to the awakening of the Buddha at uh, Bodh Gaya. And in this painting too, we have references to body, speech and mind. Uh, the body of course is again, the representation on the front, but on the back we have writing that uh, directly refers to the speech form of uh, the teacher. So he is essentially treated in the same way as a deity representation. And we have the stupa shape here outlined in yellow and then uh, written into it. Uh, and it's a more ancient form of stupa that is represented here. And this is something that Tibetans took over from uh, Indian examples where stupas are occasionally represented on the back of uh, sculptures like in this uh, particular uh, piece from the Asian Art uh, Museum in San Francisco. The a painting is when, when painted is just a painting. Yeah, it's not a a sacred item. To become a sacred item, it has to be consecrated. And the consecration is indicated through the writing on the back, on the one hand, through the purification mantra that is uh, written uh, vertically, the syllables Oma Hum, as, as I mentioned before. And on the other hand, through uh, what is called the 
the Yidal Mahetu verse, or what I call the consecration verse, which is a, a standard verse in Buddhism, a fairly old one, that uh, kind of represents the nucleus of the Buddha's teaching. Uh, and that particular verse is used in this context as a means to consecrate the item with the teaching of the Buddha. Yeah, And that's essentially in this section uh, that is uh, kind of singled out in red on the slide, uh, that consecration verse is found. It's a text that is essentially written in Tibetan letters, but using Sanskrit language. So it's transliterated, uh, uh, or actually transcribed into uh, Tibetan. Again, this is something that is found in, on Indian objects already, sometimes even on the front uh, in this particular stele with the Buddha, we have the consecration verse written on the halo uh, behind the head uh, and consecrating the item in this way. The painting is of course, uh, also an embodiment of Buddhist practice, and that is represented through essentially the texts on the back, back, which indicate different stages of the progress towards uh, awakening with the right attitude, what I call uh, for the foundation at uh, the bottom, uh, worship or veneration as a major aspect of Buddhist practice, the actual consecration or initiation into uh, a particular practice of a deity. Uh, uh, and with that one receives the lineage transmission of that teaching and its practice is supposed to bring one to Buddhahood, which would be uh, represented at the very top. And of course, you can read that also from top down. Uh, as a kind of the blessing of, of uh, the Buddha that is alluded to in the top uh, verses. Uh, on this particular painting, we also have what I call the timeless body of the teacher represented because quite uh, similarly to what we know of the life of the Buddha, the teacher is here represented repeatedly, yeah? And he's, and we know that in this particular painting, because his particular speech form is repeated on the back of many figures, all along the sides, the bottom parts of the sides and uh, along the bottom uh, row of uh, paintings, yeah? Which to us then indicates that in each of these uh, panels, the same teacher is represented that is referred to by the verse that is uh, kind of written on this slide. And so if we turn it around again and look at these uh, details, the 10 uh, fields uh, flanking the main figure left and right show different beings were different types of personalities, different occupations, royals, uh, secular people, Mahasiddha, even a Buddha and a monkey uh, that represent previous lives of uh, this, the same teacher. Yeah. And so like the Buddha had previous lives that led to his uh, final life and the awakening, the teacher is here considered as having uh, these previous lives. Uh, and usually these are kind of remembered and then written down. And in the bottom section, we actually have the same teacher represented over and over again with the same physical features, which indicates that this is the last life. These are events from the life uh, that uh, he led in the 12th century. And uh, the central sections here emphasize a kind of special feature of his life, namely that he meditated in a grass hut, which is kind of represented by this uh, domed uh, building uh, that is represented on two of these uh, kind of central 
uh, paintings. Of course, now, if the teacher's portrait is used as uh, like a deity and consecrated like a deity, the painting itself, of course, is also an object of worship, like the, the, the portrait of the Buddha would be. And uh, that is, of course, expressed then uh, in the painting on the back as well, uh, especially through the verses that are uh, added at the bottom of the inscription. But uh, what is more is that, in a way, the painting, in this case, represents a more total and more complete form of the teacher himself, yeah, representing his body on the front, speech and mind on the back. And it's clear that the painting itself serves as a kind of replacement for uh, the teacher's presence. And so within esoteric Buddhist traditions, the relationship of teacher to his disciple is extremely important. And uh, which, which of course means that usually the disciple, when he is at the same monastery, he tries to meet his teacher every day, he gets uh, teaching transmissions uh, very often, but when the teacher is absent, you can quite literally can then, or he can then use the painting as a, a replacement for the physical uh, presence of the teacher himself. Yeah, and I think that the, the fact that you have a front and the back. Uh, kind of so closely planned together, make clear that the painting here can serve as a quite literal uh, replacement for the body of the teacher and the teacher's presence. Yeah. And the teacher here, by extension, stands for the deity that he instructed his disciple to practice. And one of these practices is, of course, that you imagine your teacher in form of the deity. Yeah? And this is exactly what we have uh, depicted here, that uh, by switching the position of the teacher and the Buddha, yeah, the, this relationship uh, is indicated and the practitioner in the bottom left corner essentially practices the Buddha, but the Buddha in form of uh, his teacher. And of course, we have other uh, paintings that essentially express the same uh, sentiment in Tibetan uh, Buddhism, especially around that time. Uh, the paintings that I discussed, uh, the early ones, the two, uh, both of the Taklung Kagyu school, which is uh, one of the schools deriving from Bakmutupa. This particular drawing that I have on the screen now is from the Trigun Kagyu school, another pupil of Pagmadupa who founded his own school. And uh, on this particular case, I'm not sure if we have a detail, no. Uh, the footprints of the teachers are represented alongside with the deities. Yeah? And of course, the footprints again refer back to the Buddha because the Buddha's footprints were worshipped uh, and, uh, and still are worshipped uh, throughout uh, the Buddhist world. And equally here in Tibetan Buddhism, then the teacher's footprint, and which is probably his, uh, yeah, his actual uh, footprint applied to the canvas before uh, the drawings were made and the outline was kind of idealized uh, is, or the worship of the footprint is one of the, the kind of ultimate symbols of the devotion of the disciple to uh, the teacher. Yeah? In this particular case, we see the folding lines of uh, across the canvas and, and the damage that it made or that it afflicted to the drawing itself. So actually, this particular painting was probably not really used to hang it on the wall, 
but it was folded up and probably used in an amulet box or something like that that was taken along and we'll see that the uh, on the right side the central panels uh, those were probably the parts that were on the outside the darker ones the the darker sections while everything else was uh, protected uh, from this being folded up uh, so this would be another example but the, you you essentially find examples of that type uh, throughout the history of uh, Tibetan Buddhism around uh, yeah around 30 to 40 percent of Tibetan paintings have writings on the back that refer to the consecration and the purification of the materials and a much lesser percentage has a stupas painted on the back that refer to the mind form of the deity. Mantras, the speech form of the deity are found more often. But what is in common in each of these is that they quite literally represent the body. Yeah. Uh, and the body of uh, the deity, the body of uh, the teacher that is represented in front of it. And of course, it, what you do in consecration is you essentially invite uh, the deity into the canvas and uh, you ask uh, it to stay uh, as long as samsara lasts. And so as long as uh, the paintings or a sculpture for that matter is well preserved, it will be a fully functional representation of uh, that uh, deity or of the body of that uh, deity. Thanks. That's my uh, little summary. I'm sure there are many questions uh, and we can go to those now. <laughs> Thanks very much, Christian, for that really interesting session. Um, if people do have questions, there's a few options in terms of how to ask them. So we've got about, I'd say about 15 minutes left if you do have questions for us. Um, so you can use the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also write to us in the chat to ask any questions that you have, or if you would like to raise your hand and uh, speak, will be able to unmute you, um, but just do remember that this session is being recorded. Um, and we also have Ying Day with us as well, who is a student at SOAS. So if you do have any questions about the student experience, um, do feel free to ask those as well. There is one question, many of the paintings in the chat, uh, it essentially says many of the paintings shown are quite old. To what extent have the colors deteriorated? Uh, in the paintings that we have seen, the colors haven't deteriorated much. Uh, the paintings that I shown were probably not used much. Yeah, it's actually, they are exceptional in the sense that they are so well preserved for the age. After all, 700 years is uh, uh, to, to survive 700 years uh, kind of essentially undamaged or, or at these good conditions is, is a rare instance, which simply indicates that they probably spent most of their life rolled up uh, in. And that's a characteristic of uh, the Tibetan tanka or scroll painting that you essentially can roll it up uh, you have seen the textiles on, on top and bottom, and so you can roll it up and store it. And in this way, uh, it would preserve extremely long. The other interesting element here is that most of the colors are probably not very light sensitive. And so they wouldn't be affected by light uh, that much because most of them are, are mineral colors, at least. Uh, yeah, in, in the majority of Tibetan paintings. Yeah, and there's another question, how these paintings ended up in the Museum of Europe and the US. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, I think many ended up in museums in Europe and the US uh, from, or 
from the 19th century onwards. Of course, in the 19th century, there were this kind of, you know, et ethnographic uh, searches across the world uh, from different cultures. And so ethnographic museums uh, around the world have uh, Tibetan specimens of that time, uh, as far as they were uh, kind of available uh, to travelers. Uh, who traveled through the region and tried to essentially buy them uh, at that time. Uh, and then that tradition essentially continued into the 1930s. Uh, later on, uh, many came through the, the art market. Uh, it's assumed that uh, many of the Tibetan paintings essentially left uh, Tibet in, in, around and after 59. Uh, with Tibetan refugees going to India and that they may have sold them off uh, for, uh, yeah, for, because they needed the means uh, in this case. Uh, and so that these are the early collections. But uh, the paintings I actually showed, two of them at least only turned up in the 1990s uh, on the art market. And uh, they apparently came from a horde of Taglung related paintings that uh, is, yeah, it's not entirely clear where it was, but that was mostly distributed through the art market. And so we don't have a real provenance for that. Then there is another one, high painting as a representation or and as literally a body sounds very different to me. As for example, in Christi Christianity, as an imprint of the sacred, officially not painted, uh, that could be repainted or copied, yes. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Of course, I think one always has to be kind of careful with uh, this kind of intercultural uh, comparisons. Uh, there is, in my, we don't have a, a kind of comparable theological discussion in Tibetan uh, Buddhism as uh, we have it here mostly or, or in Christianity, mostly because it wasn't as much contested. Uh, the role of the teacher, for example, or the deity itself uh, was never as much contested in that sense. And it is also in a, in, in a Tibetan Buddhist context, they are not representing anything ultimate. Yeah, they, they are representing a means to get uh, to the awakening in itself. Yeah, and in that sense, there's quite a different status uh, that the painting has. Uh, is there an exploration of the paintings within India and Sri Lanka as well? Uh, I'm not sure you mean it so as, as a whole. Uh, I, we don't have a specialist uh, on Sri Lanka specifically, but we definitely have somebody teaching uh, Indian uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. So I uh, talk about uh, Indian Buddhist art as well. And uh, yeah, but not Sri Lanka specifically. Uh, what museums do history of art students go to? Uh, of course, the in this case, uh, the source is extremely close to the British Museum. It's just one block away. <laughs> so that's uh, the easiest uh, to go to. Uh, and then uh, the VNA, of course, would be another one. But uh, as you will uh, kind of know, there are plenty of museums in London that you could uh, that have relevant materials. And there is also there there are very good kind of library resources as well that have relevant materials. In particular, the British Library that is uh, nearby as well. And so sometimes we include those visits into our courses as well. Was there a tradition to indicate names of artists and artists uh, were artists preferred to stay anonymous? 
I can't answer the second part if they preferred <laughs> to stay anonymous, but in most cases they, they, they remained anonymous because they didn't leave their names on the paintings, but they are exceptions to the rules. There are quite a few uh, of uh, artists known from different time periods and from the 15th century onwards, we know Tibetan painters that quite literally changed the history of Tibetan painting through introducing certain types of, of uh, painting techniques or motifs that were remembered later on in Tibetan connoisseurship. Yeah, and so, so in this case, then these artists and their pupils are fairly well known. And, but the same is true for sculptors. So they weren't, it's not that frequent that we know the artists. And so, for example, from none of the paintings that I showed, we know who actually painted them. Would they have traveled that far? Uh, I'm not sure what that refers to. The artists, uh, the artists of course, uh, would uh, travel and would uh, kind of, you know, uh, work on commissions uh, across the Tibetan plateau. Uh, probably most famous among kind of. Himalayan artisanship are the Nevari artists, the artists of the Kathmandu Valley, which often were invited from Nepal to Tibet to do certain, uh, yeah, to, to accomplish certain uh, works like the creation of stupas or the creation of certain paintings. And that is a big topic uh, in this case, where we know that there is a lot of exchange. Uh, then an interesting question, what is your favorite part uh, about teaching history of art? I think my favorite part of that is going on fieldwork and actually doing the documentation myself, finding out things that I haven't or that are not known uh, yet, and uh, then writing about those <laughs> and essentially reconstructing his history, uh, the history of those. And I've done a lot of kind of field work in uh, Himachal Pradesh in India, as well as Nepal. I'll uh, travel regularly there, I'll document uh, regularly there. And it's like reconstructing the history uh, for uh, the people who actually live there. So this is something that I, I really like about this. Uh, work that I'm doing. It Do I have a favorite perfect. model module that I teach? Which one interests you most? Oh, I was very fortunate I could build my modules around my interests. So I actually like all of them <laughs> uh, that I teach. Uh, and uh, yeah, and, and they are usually uh, there are themes of cultural exchange, uh, especially the transmission of, of uh, Buddhism from India to Tibet, uh, which is one of my areas that interests me most. Another area is quite uh, similar in terms of exchange. It's, it's the Gandharan Buddhist art, where there is a lot of uh, cultural exchange as well as uh, a change in Buddhism itself that interests me. And then the uh, last question, what sort of jobs uh, does history of art feed into? Uh, of course, there, there is a lot or there are a lot of jobs around uh, art markets and museums, <laughs> and those would be the majority that are available for, uh, yeah, for uh, students of history of art. Uh, so curating or uh, assessing uh, objects for, for auctions and so on. 
Another one, okay. Are there a lot of students that do a combined degree? Combined with, or there are a lot of students that do a combined degree with language. And that's a very good idea in principle, because if you study a foreign culture, you better learn the language of that culture as well. And so I studied both uh, Sanskrit and Tibetan, and obviously you have seen that in the case of, of the presentation, uh, knowing what is written on the back and being able to read it is necessary, a necessary tool to actually uh, interpret uh, the object correctly. And then we have another uh, question. Uh, yeah, how do you, did the courses uh, adapt to the pandemic yeah that's the the problem with the the pandemic is of course that like this particular session we have to teach from home <laughs> uh, and uh, students actually many of our students currently didn't even come to london they can't actually enjoy uh, the museums we can't do events uh, related or, or showing them the objects in the museum directly. So that actually, uh, yeah, that, that cancels out a certain aspect of uh, teaching that we would otherwise include that is probably the more uh, kind of fun part and the most interesting part of the studies because seeing the life object is obviously different from uh, seeing uh, only pictures of it. Uh, those who are in London, of course, can visit uh, the museums independently. And so they can essentially bring these two aspects uh, together themselves, at least uh, as long as they were open. Uh, now, uh, of course, the museums are uh, during this lockdown and through, during the first lockdown, the museums were eventually closed as well. And so, yeah that's definitely affected but i hope by autumn that's hopefully not necessary anymore and that we can teach a uh, regular in classroom maybe with recordings for those who are still can't attend in person and i think we we also have a question in the chat from elena okay um, She's written, I'm intrigued by the various hues and colors of some of the deities. Were some of them black? Were some of them lack? Uh, no, they didn't actually use lack uh, in any of the, the paintings I showed. But what they sometimes do is polish the painting painted surface. And that gives it a kind of lack-like appearance. Uh, there, there, are, there is rare evidence of lack actually be used uh, in Tibetan painting, so it's not unknown, but it's it's rather rare. With some of the deities black, if it's black, uh, yes, there are deity representations that are black. There is actually a whole. Uh, kind of category of Tibetan painting called Naktang, which is black painting. Uh, these are essentially uh, gold paintings on black ground or gold drawings on black ground, usually on subjects that relate to uh, kind of death, channel ground, wrathfulness and stuff like that. And so, so um, the, the kind of positive utilization of that is, is painted on, on black. Uh, but I haven't shown a single example in that respect. Okay, great. Thank you very much, um, Christian. And thank you for all those questions as well from everybody. Um, I think we're gonna have to end the session here, um, but, but thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah. And Thanks, hopefully everyone. you enjoyed it. <laughs> And all the best for the rest of the year and your application and decision making uh, process as well.